And uh, I read the story and the, uh, uh, all the team guys and everything else. And the, uh, it took a lot of practice from your team to achieve what they did over there. So it was not a one-time thing. Your coach was coaching these guys for uh, almost two years before they achieved this one. And this is the one thing which uh, we have in common, actually. Uh, in Finland, uh, the weather is a little bit different than what you have here. We have a winter, we have a spring, summer, and fall. We have a four different seasons. From the sport guy point of view, it means that in the winter time I played ice hockey, summertime I played football. So Finland is quite a lot of uh, ice hockey country. Our football team has actually met your football team a long, long time ago, almost uh, 30 years ago, in a rehearsal match. You won, by the way. And uh, one of the uh, uh, very uh, interesting person from your team was actually making uh, one of the scores, El Loco. You remember, the very famous goalkeeper. All right. So let's go then to the Finland for a while. Okay, now they uh, switch me off completely. All right. He's booting something up over there. Okay. No, nevertheless, I will continue. Maybe the picture will come after a while. So, as enthusiastic like you are about the football, we are about the ice hockey in Finland, and we also have a one arc rivalry that we have always wanted to beat up, Sweden, our neighboring country. And we have been trying to get those guys ever since Finland started to play ice hockey since 1920s. But we have never ever managed to beat them on the final match and win the world championship until 1995. Amazing day. When you were scoring 5-0 in Argentina and beat up those guys, following year 1994, your cross domestic product doubled the growth rate. I don't know if it was the football match or something else, but something changed in this society. You started to believe that there is an opportunity and we will continue and have a beautiful future. Pretty much the same thing happened in Finland as well. The one thing was that the uh, we had all the best players in our team as an individual level, but as a team, we couldn't beat the Swedes. So what did we do? We hired a Swedish coach. Well, if you can't beat them, join them, as the saying goes. So we hired one Swedish coach, and he taught one very important thing for the whole team. Uh, pretty much the... Uh, are you putting up the uh, projector over there? Yeah? Is it coming up? No? Is it dead? <laughs> wow. Well, I hope that this is not the uh, black screen. This is from something like in Venezuela right now, you know, everything is blacked out. You know. Okay. So, but the one. Two minutes. Okay. So everybody, bar is open. The organizer is offering everybody free drinks. Two minutes. So, we hired the Swedish coach, and uh, he taught one thing. He interviewed every single player, of course, like all the coaches do, but he taught one very important thing, and it drills down to this picture. And this is the bridge to the business model, what I'm going to talk about. What do you see in this picture? Everybody from the team said, I see the goalkeeper. I see Swedish goalkeeper. 
except one guy. One guy who actually scored three times in the final match, made the hat trick and everything else, and was like a superhero in Finland after that. He said, I saw lots of places where I can score the puck. 99% of the team, they saw the obstacle. This guy saw the opportunity. And this is what it's all about in the business models as well. Every time when you look any business at all, you have to look not the obstacles, what the competitors are doing, look out the opportunities, because I can guarantee there always are opportunities available. Okay, the first statement that I'm going to make is that every product, every service and process alike will be wholly or partially digitalized right now. Statement number two is that because of this, new companies will emerge in business. Okay, so we are out again. Oh dear. Well, nevertheless, because of this, new companies will uh, emerge on the market and they will kick out the conventional players. If the old players on the market do not see why the business is going to change. All right? Uh, according to Gary Hamel, one of the big academians when it comes to the business and the business processes and the business models, he has put together like a 15 different business models that you can basically do when you want to do any type of business out there. Uh, I took 10 business models out of Gary Hamel's 10 business models. So I squeezed a little bit so that uh, you had a better understanding. The first business model is more or less like a traditional retailer. So what the traditional retailer does, that they are profiting by selling products and services directly to the buyers, getting the markup from the actual cost. So companies like Macy's, Walmart, that type of things. All right? So very common. The second business model is non-traditional retailer. And this is actually companies like uh, Amazon, for example, which basically is a retailer but is only operating online. They have a different type of business models inside uh, a non-traditional retailer, which are pretty much a freemium. So you get a something free, and after that, you have to pay for the services. They got the long tail. Everybody who is buying something from the Amazon, you click. Uh, everybody who bought this one bought also this one. So you are like a buying and buying all the time. And then, of course, the razors and blades, which is pretty much a, a, a synonym for the Gillette razors. So every time when a guy is going and buy the uh, uh, Gillette equipment, you get a couple of uh, blades free of charge almost. But after that, you have to buy the blades all the time because they only fit to the Gillette model. So you are hooked. That's why it's called the razors and blades. And uh, uh, I can guarantee even every business model pretty much it is that the uh, companies want to lock you in for their services. Then all you can eat. How many have tried this one? All right, wonderful, very good. There is a certain uh, limitations, of course. Uh, in uh, restaurant business, all you can eat, it means that pretty much how much your stomach can stand. So you pay a certain amount of price, you go to the restaurant, you eat as much as you can, and then you are out. Digital business is a little bit different. In digital business, all you can eat business model means that you can pay a monthly fee, flat fee like a, a Netflix is currently, uh, the Netflix is currently like $8 in US, which gives you unlimited access for all the movies that they have. You can consume them whenever you want to, with any device you want to. And that's the one thing which has changed quite a lot. So traditional all-you-can-eat business model was adapted to the digital space as well. And on top of this, there is then also the subscription model. And usually these two all-you-can-eat and subscription model are combined together. So Spotify is a very good example. And also, uh, it's uh, subscription it means that usually you pay like on a monthly basis. It could be weekly basis, quarterly, ha once in a year, half in a year. It really doesn't matter. But usually there is also the subscription. And uh, in a Spotify case, for example, you can also have a, a premium quality music. So they basically increase the beat level. 
and pretty much same as uh, also with the, uh, all the movie providers that uh, you can have at the standard level and then you can extra money, you can have at a high definition HD level as well. Landlord. So these are the guys who own something. They own the space. It could be digital space, for example. Google is a very, very good example on this. So the most famous website in the world is a Google search engine website. You land over there, they own that space. Everything what you do over there leads you to another page and they can sell the ads according to any search string that you put over there. So they own that space and that is still the money-making cow inside of Google. They are also in many other businesses, but the search is still the best business they have because the ads that they can sell. All right. Then broker. So these guys, uh, I don't know if you can recognize this guy. He's actually an uh, uh, actor called uh, Gabriel Macht, playing the leading role in the, uh, one of the TV series in the US called The Suits, which is a lawyers in New York, and he's the best broker who basically brokes the deals between two different parties over there. And he gets the money in between. He never goes to court. He hates going to the court, but as a good lawyer, he always makes it deals. All right, so very good guy. His uh, screen name is Harvey Specter. Very talented guy. So these guys are actually uh, facilitating transactions between uh, sellers and buyers, generally without ever, ever owning anything what is going to be sold. But they are profiting from the charge on the top of the sale price. And this could be, of course, physical, financial, virtual, and intellectual property as well. Artist and writer. How many of you have been writing a blogs or any articles on the internet? Please raise your hand. Okay, very good. So you are part of your business plan is also here. If your blog is going to be tremendously popular, you got a millions of visitors, millions of readers, that blog is very good for business. You can put any ads over there and people are paying a lot of money for that, that they can show their product on your website because you've got all these millions of readers. And especially if you mention their product in your blogs and so on. Previously, this was pretty much uh, uh, writers like a Stephen King that is writing books and the sculptures and so on. But in the digital space, this is also now includes the uh, journalists and online bloggers and so on. Content producers. Infographic, how many of you have ever done any infographics? All right, wonderful. I just love them. I mean, so beautiful, easy to illustrate any business that you have, any figures you have. And uh, that's like an extension for the, uh, all the Excel bars that you usually had. So this is very nice. And usually the content producers here are the uh, technical writers, graphic designers, web copywriters, and so on. Very similar to the artist, but it's focused more on the production of the content and the material that is designed to inform and explain. Manufacturer Direct. This is something that has been tried uh, many times, and the, especially in the uh, mobile space. You remember, uh, it was 2008 or 9 when Google launched their first Google phone, Google Nexus, and they wanted to sell it online. You cannot buy it from the shop, you always go to the uh, website and buy the phone. Well, they tried for a couple of months and closed down the website because it didn't work out. Some reason people just didn't want to buy from the website a mobile phone, and then they stick to the old plans and uh, you could go to the operator shop and buy it from the operator or any other uh, retailer, Walmart or Best Buy or whatever they have in the United States. Also, Apple is a manufacturer direct. So you can go to the Apple store and buy the product. You can go to the operator and buy the product. So Apple is actually having a very much a multi-channel uh, policy here. And uh, the reason why they want to be directly also interacting with you is that they get a better profit from it. Every time when you got the middleman out of the equation, better money for you. Last but not least, a trader. So pretty much the lowest level of guys they were going to buy and reselling assets, often by improving or otherwise adding value to the assets prior to the sale and so on. So these are the 10 business models which we can see also in a digital space. Also, it means that the, uh, these business models, they are not a standalone models. Usually they are connected to each other. 
So if, uh, if you have a deck of 10 different business models, you shuffle them, you take a three cards out of it, you combine those three business models together, and then you have a new business model. Because everybody is using different models, and the ultimate end game and goal is very interesting that, that everybody is talking about the ecosystems. I want to be a part of the ecosystem. Um, who noticed that the, on the Tuesday, it was Tuesday that the Microsoft bought the Nokia mobile phones? All right, big thing. And I wonder that the software company throughout the whole history of Microsoft is now also a hardware company. And the reason being, and the next slide that I'm going to show to you is done by uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, Nokia guys back in the 2008 already when he left the company. He saw what is going to happen, where this big ecosystem players are actually going to go. They don't want to be the part of the ecosystem. They want to be the ecosystem themselves. All right? And this is where they, this is actually what they want to do. Unfortunately, you cannot see the, uh, pretty much the whole picture over there. But this is a business model which basically uh, the blue dot on the middle is the best possible business model. And that means that you control everything. Now, if you think about it in a digital space, who is pretty close to this? Who controls the device? Who controls the uh, store where you can buy all the applications? Who controls the content that you are getting? And everything else, Apple. Apple is very close to be on the center. And that's where everybody else wanna go as well. Google wants to be there. Yahoo, after now, the Marisa Meyer have taken over. They wanna be there. Microsoft, now after buying uh, Nokia, they wanna be there as well. Everybody aims to be in the middle. And they want to have their own ecosystem where they are pretty much controlling everything. And when they control everything, it means bigger and better profits for them. So more money. And this is now making it very difficult for the new guys to enter to the business. Because now we are talking about the multi-billion enterprises with the tentacles in every field of business. And that's one thing that the, uh, the disruptions in certain industries are going to be very difficult to make, especially now when we've got the big players over there. Okay, next what I'm going to talk to you is about the, uh, the next disruptions that I think that is going to happen. Uh, sorry, yeah, there's one more, actually two slides. So the, this is actually illustrates the biggest difference between the old business models and how the business is actually run and the new ones. What we are currently doing is that the uh, previously Roaches, for example, put that there is a five different steps how you enter to the market. Innovators, early adapters, early maturity, late maturity, and then the rest. Now, in a new business model, trial users, and then the whole market. Because in today, when you have a digital delivery channel, you can be global immediately. If you're in a gaming industry, if you're in a content delivery industry, it doesn't matter. You can extremely fast be global immediately. You've got a bunch of trial users, they think that it's a good idea, good product, put it on the delivery channel, and off you go. And that fundamental change basically uh, ends the conventional wisdom that what we have. This is now taken from the uh, uh, Accenture 2013 uh, second uh, release release and the, uh, it's based on the one book which is called uh, The Big Bang Disruption. And the, uh, on the uh, left hand side, conventional wisdom, right hand side, the Big Bang Wisdom, so I'm going to read them through because they're going to basically see them. Conventional wisdom, focus on only one strategic discipline, generate strategy, low cost, production innovation or customer intimacy. That has been the uh, previously. Now, compete in all three disciplines at the same time. Secondly, first target, I mean the conventional one, first target a small group of uh, early adopters and later enter to the mainstream market. Not anymore. Market to all segments at the same time. Be ready to scale up and exit if needed very fast. Innovation side, seek innovation in a lower cost, feature poor technologies that meet the needs of the underserved customers or segments. That was conventional side. Today, seek innovation through rapid-fire, low-cost experimentation on 
across all the popular platforms. So, uh, we have talked now about a little bit uh, about uh, business models and uh, I, uh, what I want you to understand is that the, uh, every time when you see and think about that this company on the market, uh, think about what business model they have. Is they a landlord, manufacturer, direct, broker, trader, what? Try to understand what is their business model. And that usually gives you the understanding that what are the opportunities out there? What could be your potential new business model so that you can enter to the market? One market which uh, I kind of think personally that has been very late to uh, enter to this new area is TV. It's the same old stupid box. It's the same old bundle channels that you have to subscribe. You get a, I like sci-fi channel, telenovelas, and then you get a 20 channels that you don't need. All right? Not very customer friendly in a day when you have a device that you want to access to any content, anywhere, anytime, whenever it suits you. That's supposed to be what they're supposed to offer you, but that's not what they are doing. They are offering you bundle channels, etc. And also that you have to follow a certain programs on every Wednesday evening at 10 o'clock or so. That's not today. That's yesterday. The future, which I think that now when the Apple is also cooking up something, and I think that they're going to reveal it next month, the uh, next generation Apple TV. But what I think is that, that there has been a couple of disruptions which are already showing that the uh, uh, TV industry is going to change. And it's going to change forever. All traditional players, they have to be now very careful because most likely some of them will be kicked out in the business that where they have been already decades. Example. House of Cards. How many have seen this? Wonderful. I love Kevin Spacey. I have seen the guy live once in uh, uh, Las Vegas in one mobile conference. He was one of the keynote speakers. Beautiful stage presence. Wonderful actor. House of Cards uh, was original content from Netflix. So basically they did in order from the traditional studios or anybody else. They made it by themselves. So Netflix is actually a delivery channel, but they made their own content, which is only available on Netflix, not anywhere else. Original content, and this was a huge success, I mean. They changed lots of rules. First of all, I think that there's a 12 or 13 episodes in the uh, first season. They put all of them online at the same time. You don't have to wait for the next week and then for the next week. Everything was available online immediately which means that you can watch during Saturday and Sunday all the 13 episodes at once, whenever it suits you. And that's a big, big, big difference here. Also, what they did was that the, uh, and I quote here, uh, as Peter Kafka pointed out in All Things Digital and Richard Greenfield of BTIG Research, calculated that the eye-popping number, which was 4 billion hours of streaming video in the first three months when they put this online, it would make House of Cards the most watched cable television network ever. Except it isn't a cable, it isn't on a television, and it's not network. And that's a big disruption that is going on over there. So, for the longest time, the media business, the uh, concept of bundling has been very foundational in the TV industry. Ads go with the editorial content in the print, commercials go with the programming on the television, and the channels you desire are paired with the ones you don't like. And that is going to change a lot. So, I believe that TV industry is going to change a lot, and there is a certain disruptions that are coming up. First of all, Netflix, of course, what we have seen is an all-you-can-eat model. You pay a flat fee on a monthly basis, and then you can watch whatever you want, whenever you want, in basically whenever device you want as well. It doesn't matter, you got the uh, iPhone, you got the Android phone, you got the Windows phone, you got the tablet, you got the TV, it really doesn't matter how you watch them. So, all you can eat model with the Netflix, and then we have a company called Hulu, which is uh, advertisement base, which is free of charge for the uh, we are uh, for the consumer, but they get money from the advertisers. And the, uh, we were actually in the, in the transmedia uh, 
monetization panel today in the morning, and the, uh, now it's upside down. So this is getting weird, you know? <laughs> wow. How, how you can do that? Yeah, the guy is keeping the, you know, system there, standing their hands or something, yeah? Nevertheless, but the disruptions that are going to be in the TV industry, and this is, I think that it will also affect here in Colombia, so your telenovelas will be available with some other channels, there will be lots of original content and so on. Point being here is that the uh, 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 Google guys have already figured it out, they bought a couple of technology companies. I just actually heard it myself, I have unfortunately missed those news, but I heard it from the one guy in the panel, that they have bought a company, actually two of them, which can basically overlay on the movie stream. So when you are watching in your iPad, you are watching uh, mm, Sex in the City, for example. All right? And you see that the uh, ladies are having a beautiful dress. You can pause the video, tap the dress. You can see immediately who made it, how much does it cost, where it's available, and you can order it online. And this is going to revolutionize quite a lot of things. So we don't have a commercial breaks anymore. You watch the movie, you pause it whenever you want, you see something interesting, you click it, you buy it. And now in the uh, Amazon, what they are doing in the US is that they want to make it one, uh, I mean the same day delivery. You order it in the morning, afternoon the guy is knocking on your door, here's your dress, ma'am. Beautiful. It's going to change a lot of different things over there. And uh, Google is most likely going to try this in the YouTube first. And uh, mark my words, uh, Google guys are going to enter to the TV business as well because they want to be the ecosystem. They don't want to be just a part of the ecosystem. They want to be the ecosystem where you are locked in. All right. Then there could be uh, more uh, unconventional ways as well. Uh, the uh, one unfortunate thing with the uh, digital business is that the content, which if we go back to the 20 years or, or so, you bought the uh, CD record or you bought the LP, the very conventional, you bought the record, it was yours. You can feel it, you can touch it, you can borrow it to your friend, he can borrow it to his friend and her friend and so on. Yep. Yeah, sure, do it. Do it, no problem. Yeah, change it. Put it upside down, inside out. <laughs> you know. So, point being, what I was saying here was that the uh, uh, resolution is going to be changed, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been a little bit difficult with the screens here, but hopefully these guys will fix it up. Now it's even bigger. Wow. Okay. So, the next uh, more in, uh, un, yeah, unconventional way of doing things is that uh, previously when you own the record, you can uh, uh, borrow it to your friend and you can resell it as well because it was your property. But today it's a little bit more complicated. If you're a part of the ecosystem, how many of you are part of the Apple ecosystem? Please raise your hand. Okay, very good. So, unfortunately, bad news for you, because you cannot change to the Android ecosystem and keep all the songs and every else content that you have bought from the Apple ecosystem. They don't just transfer with you, because if you change the device, you're out of the ecosystem. And that's the one thing which is, a, a, I kind of think that it's a, our fault in a way that we have accepted this type of things. You don't own the song. You have only have a right to listen to it. And that's it. Somebody else owns the song. Whenever you lose your phone, if you have downloaded something, they are gone. That's the one thing. If you don't have a backup in the cloud. Okay. So the one thing with the, when it comes to the TV industry is that the, uh, there could be a marketplace potentially. So if you are bundled up and the disruption doesn't happen so fast, you're bundled up, you've got a certain channels that you don't want to watch. But there might be somebody else who wants to watch them. And he or she might have a channels that you want to watch. So you could swap them over. Give me your channels that you don't want to watch and I will give these channels that you want to watch. So that there could be an aftermarket where you could sell different type of uh, uh, channels that you don't need. Okay? Then, of course, uh, if you go a little bit further than what the Netflix is actually doing, is that uh, uh, 
Now thinking about that the uh, companies like a Microsoft and Google and Apple wants to be the ecosystem. Mark my words, we will see a day when Apple will have an original content which is financed by Apple. They make something which is only available for the Apple users. Some movie, some series, which is not available anywhere else because they want you to be locked in, in their ecosystem. Mark my words, Google will do the same. So we will see different content providers which are totally different than they are today. Today it's the studios who pretty much do all the TV shows. Then one more is that the, what we have already seen in a couple of examples is that the, uh, you can skip the studios. If you've got the actors, you've got a couple of uh, guys who do the screenwriting, and then somebody who makes the story, crowdfunding. Ask from the viewers, give me five bucks, we will make the next best TV series out there. And as a return, you are the first who are going to view it. You've got 100,000 guys out there, having a five bucks, you are earning pretty good money, you can start the production, and then you skip the studios, you are directly interacting with the consumer. Almost in every case when there is a disruption in a business model, it's always kick out the middleman or be the middleman yourself so that you own the ecosystem. All right? So we are back in the... Uh, Let's now go to the end. All right, so this was actually the picture that I was talking about. The huge ecosystem, so you can see pretty much all the players right now, they are over there. And this is called technology, access, uh, internet, and the uh, content, was it said over there? Oh, it's so bad, this stuff. But nevertheless, in the middle is the best business model, which basically means that you control everything which is surrounding that, okay? This is done by the Finnish guy, like I said, used to be working for the Nokia, uh, Mr. Risku. So you can check from the internet, that guy. All right. Yeah, it's also here, the Juhani Risku mentioned over here. All right. This is pretty much the end of the, uh, the presentation. I would like to thank you and also the organizers here. And I think that the, uh, uh, always remember, don't look the obstacles, look the opportunities, because that's what it's all about in a business model. So you can find a totally new combination of doing business in a certain field that you can outplay all the competitors out there. All right? Be strong. Next time, when, you, uh, when, you, when is the next football game? Tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, Venezuela? Oh. Okay. Very good. Okay. I will keep the thumbs up that you will win that one. Thank you very much. Ask for any questions. Tell them to ask for any questions. And if you have questions, just give me a minute. I will put the uh, translator on. There is one question. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, how are you? Uh, I have a question about the Spotify. You talk about the Spotify, right? Uh, on the last, sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, you talk about the Spotify, right? Uh, on the last Time magazine, Spotify. It says that Spotify lost nearly 80, uh, 78 million dollars last year. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is happening? We are not ready. They are, we, they are way ahead of their technology, or we are not ready for these kind of business models. I think that we are ready for that type of business models, but what we have also seen that there's a lot of competitors coming out there. And that's the one thing that you have to keep in mind. And music business is very complicated when it comes to all the licenses, where you, which country you can play the songs and which country you cannot play the song, and what is the pricing level for that. And uh, 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 I kind of think that the, uh, uh, this all-you-can-eat type of business model when it comes to the music is not really there yet, you know? There's lots of songs that I cannot find from the Spotify at all, but there's a bunch of songs that you can pretty easily find. So having this type of uh, uh, universal uh, 
a music provider which basically covers all the songs, it doesn't matter where you live, uh, could be something that is going to happen, but the pricing model is still a little bit loose. Nobody actually knows how you're going to price that one. Uh, my belief is that the music industry is doing better than ever, even though that we got these streaming services and you can download the songs, 99 cents or whatever they are costing, but the uh, music industry is doing better than ever. But the uh, uh, Spotify is having a very tough competition coming up. You remember uh, Nokia did this uh, 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 one handset which says comes with the music. So somebody else basically paid for the music that you are going to listen. And I kind of think that that's going to come again, a little bit differently packaged. But uh, uh, I believe that the Microsoft is going to do that. And uh, I also believe that some of the other handset manufacturers are going to bundle up services for you whenever you buy their handset. It could be unlimited data, which is bundled up already. You only pay for the phone calls or messaging services, all right? It could be TV content already paid up when you buy the handset for the next two years or something like that. And same with the music. But the, uh, uh, how many of you are using Spotify? Please raise your hand. Yeah. How many else is using something else? Yeah, very good. So there is the competition as well. That restricts as well. All right, very good. Next question, please. Thank you. Gracias. Digamos que en el momento de definir un modelo de negocios para ciertos productos para los que se cree, para los cuales se cree que no va a haber una demanda muy amplia, sino que son productos un poco más focalizados en nichos específicos del mercado. ¿Qué aconsejaría usted para definir un modelo de negocio sin intentar modelos gratuitos o modelos premium o modelos en los cuales hay muestras gratis y después engancha al cliente? Digamos, es muy difícil y pues yo supongo que esto que la respuesta proviene del ensayo y el error, pero ¿qué aconsejaría usted para definir un modelo de negocios de estos? What type of uh, uh, product or service you are talking about? Es un servicio educativo en línea. Okay, who is the paying customer? Eh, el cliente final, es el, es el que paga. Okay, so it's a private consumer, uh, sí. Yeah. Sí, sí, okay. Sí. Okay. All right. All right. Very good question indeed. Uh, just uh, out of the blue, I would say that the uh, educational services, um, you providing them online, uh, I think that the uh, some sort of all you can eat model could be something included with the subscription so that you can add something else over there which is best like a seasonal pass in a TV industry you know that could be something but definitely not a one-time fee yeah yeah Gracias. you're welcome um. all right shoot hi uh, in that uh, upcoming scene that you're talking about, uh, since traditionally large media companies were the ones who had the budget to finance these productions, uh, whether they were uh, television, movies, or whatever, in terms of all media, and I'm, here I'm including traditional book publishing companies, etc., anybody who's producing media nowadays, um, since self-publishers <laughs> can... Uh, take out uh, the middleman, as you're saying, and, and we now have access. We still have that problem that sometimes uh, great ideas require a big budget, and not, uh, as they said yesterday uh, at the panel, uh, the ideas that work through crowdfunding are when your IP is already known, or you have something that people um, are already fans of, whether it's an actor or... Uh, whatever. Uh, so for new IP and in whatever media it is, um, I wanted to ask you what do you think is like the future model 
in that environment where uh, people like Amazon, Apple, Netflix are going to be the ones who are actually financing the productions, but then small producers, whether it's uh, books, movies, series or apps or whatever, small producers are the ones that need to actually get into <laughs> their whatever, premium content or their productions. That was a quite a multifolded type of a question. Let me let me give me give me a couple of seconds to uh, distill this a little bit. I think that I need a bit beer for this. Hmm. Okay, uh, for the new IP, uh, I mean uh, um, naturally, I mean uh, give me a little bit of background of the crowd financing part here is that you can basically test pretty easily if there is a demand for your new idea on the market or not. If the people are not giving you the one or two dollar investment for your new idea, it's not going to fly. And that's a cheap way because it doesn't basically cost you anything. It just costs you to uh, contact the Kickstarter and put your new idea over there and see how the people will react for that. Okay? The other uh, thing which uh, uh, actually is uh, uh, a bit related to this one, but is going to be very interesting, is that the, uh, today the Kickstarter, we actually thought about in the, in the panel in the morning, today the Kickstarter is that the, you give a couple of dollars, five dollars, ten dollars max, what do you get is a t-shirt and a, maybe a, a pre-sample of the products or something like that. But if the company is going to make a multi-billion business, even though that you have invested in the first place, you are not going to get anything else. You've, always, you've still got the T-shirt, right? Now comes the very interesting thing that the, with the crowd financing, it could be also crowd, uh, crowd investment, that you actually are an investor for the company. So if the company makes millions or billions, you will get money back from them. You are just like any other shareholder. You have put 10 bucks in, you get a 100 out. So pure money. But uh, when it comes to your question, I kind of think that the... Uh, uh, especially the crowd uh, financing part has disrupted this that even though that the guys have the big money and everything else there are now delivery channels where you can get into with basically with no money at all and have at the global audience if they like your product they will definitely have a way to buy it as well so I kind of see that uh, uh, what is comes after this is a very good question because I really don't know after crowd financing after crowd investment what's what's the next so it's very interesting to see what is going to happen. I mean, the crowd investment will be there definitely, that you will get money back, not only the t-shirts, if the company will succeed. But the, uh, uh, if we look from three to five years from now, it will be totally different once again. And uh, that's the thing that they be open. Look the world, don't think about the obstacles, think about the opportunities, because basically everything is possible if you just find the right combination to do it. I don't think exactly did I answer your question? It was so difficult, but the, uh, I hope that this will do. Thank you. Next one, please. Any other? Ah, there is one. Buenas tardes. Give me a second. Buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Carlos Quiñones. Y yo, yo veo con preocupación la, la presentación que usted hizo, porque aunque al principio muestra oportunidades para la mayoría de las personas, al final noto que si quiero ser exitoso, o debo ser Apple, Microsoft o Google, para poderlo ser. O sea, veo que si el modelo de negocio sigue así, solamente los monopolios van a poder, por llamarlo así, como ser exitosos. O es una por una percepción que algo erróneo que entendí mal, no sé. O sea, veo que solamente los monopolios pueden ser exitosos en este mundo digital. Como no. Thank you, Carlos. Excellent question. I was wondering that you are the only one who dared to ask these questions because the pictures that I showed to you, uh, this one, yeah, it really says that uh, there is a handful of big players who wants to own the whole ecosystem where they are active. Definitely yes. Those guys who are around there, they want to get to the center as well. And uh, it's getting crowded. Yeah, it's getting difficult to get there. And naturally these guys are protecting whatever they have. 
That's why it's so difficult to break up the ecosystems. I don't believe that Apple is going to open up cross-platform so that um, if you're an iTunes u user, you can have it in your Android phone as well. I don't believe that it's going to happen. Apple wants to own the product, the service, the delivery channel, the content. They want to own the whole value chain. Now the question back to you is actually, if you got a good business model, good product or service that you are selling, what usually have been happening here in this space is that these big guys are buying you out. They give you an awful lot of money, they buy your service, and then they integrate it to their ecosystem. But yeah, I don't know how many big players then there can be out there. Now we, this has been pretty much Western world oriented picture, as you can see. There's lots of different stuff that the Chinese guys are cooking in their own market right now. China Mobile, which is the biggest mobile operator, having more than 600 million users. If they decide to do something, having their own app store, they can do it. If they want to have their own content to deliver to their clients, they can do it. Google cannot compete, Apple cannot compete. They can do it by themselves. So there is still room out there. The question actually is in which markets you are operating, how global you want to be. But there are still regional players out there, like in China, most likely also in India will be. And I also think here in the Latin America as well. Because this is like one part of the world where you can make a big, big difference. But yeah, it's getting difficult. It's getting very difficult. And these guys, they are protecting their business, as we can see. But very good question indeed. It's getting difficult. Next one, please. Good. Gubernamentalmente se puede hacer que, no, que ellos no sean dueños de todos, o sea, hay alguna forma que se pueda restringir a esas empresas en no ser dueñas de todo el contenido digital que existe. I think that that's the part of the where the society has to step in. If somebody is going to be in the monopolistic situation, it doesn't, uh, it actually is not good for the consumer. So the society's point is that the consumer has to have a choices. If you don't have a choices, then they are going to break up those monopolies one way or another. That's what we have seen in the telecommunication sector. Some of the uh, big telcos are owning too much of the infrastructure so that the local government thinks in some particular country that you are in a monopolistic situation. You cannot have more than 50% of the uh, uh, broadband in this country. So it's a law that you have to sell assets out. And I think that that's uh, one step that we are going to see that the, uh, the governments are going to restrict. Because if there is, if you, as a consumer, if you don't have a, any other choice, it's not the fair play anymore. And as a consumer, you should have, and the governments and the society role is protect the consumer. These guys don't care about, they only care about your money. They want to put both hands in your both pockets and take everything what you got. Okay, any uh, other questions, please? Nope. All right, then my humble thanks. Thank you.